Hi, I'm Les Rapchak, CEO of NextFlow Air Products Corp. Specialist in compressed air technology for blow off, drying, cleaning, conveying, and cooling. This presentation is going to be about utilizing compressed air for cleaning, drying, and cooling. Now, give you some guidelines. First thing you want to do is you want to define the purpose that you want to accomplish in your manufacturing operation. Is it to remove liquid? Is it to remove dust? Is it to cool the product? The second thing, nature of the surface. Is the surface that you're addressing, is it a rough surface? Is it a smooth surface? Is it fixed, indexed? Is it moving? How fast is it moving? Is it statically charged? Which is very important if you're trying to move, uh, remove dust. Third thing, the nature of the material that has to be removed. Is the material on there very thick? Is it thin? Is it viscous? Is it sticky? Is it very loose? Does it hold heat or does it release heat easily? Which depends on the type of material if you want to cool that particular surface. And of course, is it again statically charged or not? Is it relevant? Fourth, which do you want to use to uh, clean or dry or cool? Do you want to use blower technology or do you want to use compressed air technology? There are advantages and disadvantages to both. Things you have to consider are availability of the power source. You want to consider the capital cost and the running cost over time. You want to consider the maintenance involved in each particular choice. Is there space? Uh, what type of a footprint does the, choose, uh, does the chosen technology actually take up? The risk and reliability. What's the risk involved should the system break down? If it's a blower, if a motor can break down, can you replace the motor quickly? If it's compressed air, the risk is much, uh, much greatly alleviated. But it depends on the application. The actual effectiveness of the technology chosen. Well, that will depend on the force and velocity that's required to address your particular application. Is the application continuous, continuous cleaning, continuous cooling, or is it intermittent? These are the factors you have to consider. So for now, since this is a presentation on utilizing compressed air, let's presume that you've chosen to utilize compressed air for the given application. So what do you use? Do you use nozzles? Do you use annular air jets? Do you use flat air jets? Do you use something called an ear knife, which is basically a very long nozzle? Or do you utilize annular airflow amplifiers? We're going to describe each one and how to choose among them. So first, let's talk about compressed air nozzles. Every air nozzle is different, both on the inside and the outside. Generally, there are two types. There's the bullet-shaped nozzle, that I have here, and there's also the more traditional cone-shaped nozzle. Uh, depending on the design, uh, one would be more appropriate than the other. The bullet-shaped type tends to give a bit more force for any unit amount of compressed air consumption or force per CFM, a little bit higher. But you get a higher velocity and a greater amplification of flow with the cone-shaped types, at least for the smaller sizes. As the sizes get larger, they pretty much approach the same kind of performance. So what's interesting is that every nozzle is different, not only on the outside, but also on the inside. You can get two, three, four different nozzles that look exactly the same, but could be very different on the inside, and can be very different performance figures. Same thing with the cone shape. They can look exactly the same on the outside, but by having different inside design, you can get either good efficiency or not so good efficiency. Flow pattern matters. With nozzles, you typically not only have one, you have a row along a manifold. Every nozzle is going to have a flow profile, either very narrow or very wide. The wider the profile, then the less force per square inch or square centimeter you're going to get on your surface. 
as you move away from the, from the target, that pull pattern spreads out and that force spreads out over a larger area. Same thing with the bullet shape nodules. They have a certain flow pattern, same rules apply. So what's very important to recognize is that the force, the flow, and the velocity does depend on the particular design and the distance from the target. So the distance between the nozzle and the, and the number of nozzles you're going to need for your application is going to be determined by how far you're going to be from that target. And if the target is going to change in distance, nozzles may not be the best choice because let's say you've got a row of nozzles and your target is here. It's going to have a certain pull pattern. If you get too close, the pull pattern is not going to cover all of that target. If the target's too far away, the full pattern is going to start to interfere. If the full patterns interfere, you're going to get turbulence and you're going to get a less effective or maybe even a very poor result in your cleaning or drying application. Same thing with cooling because turbulence will, be, will actually uh, hurt that effect as well. So the distance between the nozzles, the number of nozzles is all going to be determined by the distance you are from the target. You want the necessary force, velocity, and flow for your particular application. So with nozzles, positioning is very, very important. The further you are away from the nozzles, the more dissipated that force is going to be over a given, uh, over a given area. So the second product to consider is compressed air operated air jets. I have a brass one and a stainless steel one in my hand. Compressed air operated air jets are basically big nozzles or small hair flow amplifiers. They can be adjustable, such as these, to be able to adjust the gap to be able to control the amount of flow and force coming out. And uh, in actual fact, they can be a lot more powerful and efficient than air nozzles. However, air nozzles being somewhat less costly tend to be chosen more often. Also, nozzles are more of a point effect. With air jets, you get more of a hand effect because the air pull pattern coming out is wider. But as far as force and velocity, these do become a very, very good alternative to nozzles if you need a good, powerful force and the extra cost is, uh, makes it worthwhile to do so. Now, as with air nozzles, the flow pattern does matter. There'll be a flow pattern coming out of the air jet so the distance from the park, distance between the jets, uh, the force dissipates over distance, velocity dissipates over distance, etc. Same rules as with nozzles, okay? The distance between the jets and the target matter, as well as the number of jets that you would choose for the application. They're very, very efficient for cooling small areas. Um, the outlet of the air jet is normally around, around a quarter of an inch, sometimes a little bit larger. But with the flow pattern, if you want to cool a very small part that's very hot, you want to cool to a cooler temperature, these can be very, very efficient in cooling, much more efficient than air nozzles. If it's a cooling application, seriously consider utilizing an air jet as opposed to an air nozzle. So, as far as the general for blow off applications and cleaning and drying, uh, the same thought process, of, process would go into choosing the air jets and deciding the number and the distance and placing of the air jets, the same thought process as you would use with air nozzles. The third product range to consider for your application is a compressed air operated flat jet. Flat jets provide a linear flow, a linear flow profile. And designs do vary from one to another. I have two different designs in my hand, the Nexco design and a, and a plastic one. Material is important. If you're going to be using a plastic material, make sure it's an area where if it breaks, it's not going to cause a problem. We actually had a situation once where a rather concerned customer had, con had contacted us. They were previously utilizing plastic units. Some broke. And um, as a result, on that particular application where a row of them were utilized to move some very heavy material, heavy paper actually, because some were broken, um, one of the uh, laborers lost their life. And of course, they replaced all the plastic with more, 
more reliable and safer to use uh, metal ones. So it's okay to use plastic, but recognize that in some applications it may not be the ideal solution. On the other hand, there is a big cost difference, and plastic can be a lot less costly than utilizing metal. So it really depends on your application. But material is important. They all have different flow profiles. However, it's not like an, an annular air jet. It's not like a nozzle because the flow profile is going to vary along the, uh, the width of the particular unit. It's not going to vary along the actual uh, overall length of it. Normally, air jets are placed right beside each other on a manifold so it can cover a wider uh, linear length. They're ideal for blow off and for drying and for cleaning a surface that's relatively flat uh, or a curved surface and does a very good job and they're very popular as a result. However, flat jets are used primarily when air dyes, which is an alternative technology we're going to talk about next, uh, don't have the force. The, the flat jets can give you the necessary force. Some flat jets, like the plastic one, are non-adjustable. However, uh, the metal one we have utilizes shims, and you can vary the number of shims and vary the force as a result. So when you need the variation and when you don't, again, it depends on your application. But flat jets are flexible uh, uh, when you can adjust the different shims to give it the force you need for any difficult blow off cleaning or drying application. The distance between the jets and the target is less sensitive than it is with uh, annular, annular air jets or with nozzles. Um, but it obviously it doesn't matter. The further you're away, the flow profile will spread out a little bit. Normally, they are placed end to end, but not always. Um, because you have the items discrete, there's going to be a little bit of a, a turbulence that the flows between the units intersect. So you're not going to always get really even flow between each piece. So if you need to get absolutely even flow along the length of the blow-off application, it's probably not the best choice. But if you need a very powerful force or very, very high velocity for your application, then the flat jets can be an ideal solution. The fourth product, and one of our favorites, are compressed air operated air knives. I have in my hand one of the Nextflow Extreme Air Blade air knives. Air knives are basically long, flat nozzles and very, very popular. They're extremely quiet, they're quite efficient, and generally have a fairly even flow all the way along the edge. At least they should if they're all properly made. Not every air knife is made all well by many people, so always check to see how even that flow is across the face of the air knife. Uh, material is also very important. A lot of people, uh, uh, when they buy air knives and put them in an industrial facility, you want them to last a long time. The air knives that we produce are all anodized, and that makes a big difference in the long run. Even if the flow is even, the unfortunate limitation on your knives is the amount of force it can generate, just because of the intrinsic design on the inside. That's when you go to the flat jets as an alternative, when you need that extra force. You can increase the force from an air knife by uh, adding shims on the inside to open the air gap. However, you're limited to normally about maybe four shims. Gives you a pretty good force, but if you really need a super powerful force, generally have to default to flat jets. But for even flow, very quiet operation, air knives are very popular. As with the flat jets, they're less sensitive to distance from the target. Uh, a nice sharp flow, flow profile allows you to hold the air knife uh, six to even 12 inches away in many cases to get a reasonable uh, cleaning and drying effect for your application. Now, one of the big advantages is to be able to attach to an air knife an anti-static device. The anti-static device can take the charge away from the charge surface and then easily blow it off. Because it's an even flow all the way along, if you're doing, say, like a class A surface in the automotive industry, you get very, very effective cleaning as compared to having discrete nozzles or, or jets. That even flow does make a difference in very, very uh, high quality services that you need to have really clean. So just combine it with an anti-static device. 
Contrary to popular belief, because some people say he had a static device, uh, make the air knife more powerful, any static device will take static away at 10 feet away. Well, that's just not true. Uh, if you have a very high moving uh, conveying system or a very, very highly charged part, the air knife doesn't affect how fast that static dissipates. The static bar itself is going to give you an idea of how fast the static dissipates. All the air knife does is clean. It doesn't take away static. The static part is that. So think logically, okay? If you have a very high, uh, fast moving surface, that's statically charged, or a very, 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 very high charged surface, and you say you're using an air knife with a static bar, but it's not quite eliminating the dust because the static is still there, then you have to address the static device, not the air knife, the static device itself. It's ideal where even flow is needed, and it's very, very low in noise levels. A very, very big, important uh, uh, consideration in many applications. It's also very good for cooling many surfaces. Normally for cooling, uh, we tend to recommend the air amplifiers, which we'll talk about next, but the air nice because it has a very, very good, uh, efficient, and strong laminar flow at a distance, it can cool surfaces very quickly as well. The fifth product to consider is the compressed air operated airflow amplifier. I have a small one in my hand, a fixed unit. They come in both fixed versions and in adjustable versions. So you can actually adjust the gap, fix it in place. With the fixed version, it has a ship in there. You can stack ships to also vary the performance. They are used to clean and dry more complex surfaces. They have very, very low noise levels. But the most popular application next to venting, because they can be used for venting, they work by having the air come in one end, the air comes out here, and it creates a vacuum line. So it's ideal for venting uh, light materials a certain distance, uh, although there are other products for conveying that uh, we'll talk about in some other video in the future. Uh, but it's ideal for uh, certainly venting gases and so on. But the biggest use we found is for cooling. In fact, they're about 25% more efficient than utilizing air nights for cooling. And that's because of the very high amount of um, air that's drawn in into the amplifier. They basically convert the energy that's normally lost as noise and pressure drop into useful flow. Now, with cooling, um, you can have them on manifolds, you can have uh, you know, single individual devices, and they have different size amplifiers for that result. You can add an anti-static uh, device to the unit. Uh, this is great if you want to, say, uh, reduce the static inside uh, a spoiler, inside perhaps uh, a bold part. You blow the amplified anti-static air in, all the, all the Particulate that could be inside will obviously lose its static charge and will be able to drop out of the particular product that you're trying to clean on the inside. So, anti static uh, devices can be added. But again, one of the biggest applications is for cooling. One thing I do want to point out in utilizing air amplifiers they are often marketed on something called an air amplification ratio. What that is properly defined is the ratio of the amplified air coming out at the exit divided by the air that's actually uh, consumed by the device. Be very wary when you see artificially or what appears to be artificially high amplification ratios. And think about this logically. The way it amplifies airflow is you're taking moving air from the compressed air line and you're bringing in still air from the surrounding atmosphere, air that's not moving. When you combine it, it's going to slow down the velocity. You bring in too much of the air from the outside, it slows down too much. If you slow down too much, you're not going to get hardly any force and velocity, and it's not going to do anything. So if you see any air amplification ratio that's say above 16 or 17, I would be suspicious. It might be correct, but then check the performance. But be very, very wary because the term amplification ratio tends to be very, very misleading. And it's something we, we obviously utilize these ratios as well. And 
but we try to stay away from them. And that's because it also varies with the conditions. If your pressure goes down, the application actually, the application ratio actually goes up. If the surrounding air is warmer, your application ratio actually goes up. It's very, very situational. So even the figures that we publish uh, for application ratio are sort of like the mean figure, okay? Which is great for engineering purposes. Quite often you want to be able to calculate that uh, to get some idea of the actual flow coming out. Also, if you attach something to the end of the air, of the air coming out of the amplifier or at the entrance of the air coming in, you will reduce that ratio because of back pressures involved in, in either case. So be very wary of that term. However, amplifiers, again, ideal for cooling. They're great for blowing off uh, more complex surfaces. They have very low noise levels, and they can be, again, combined with an anti-static device to remove dust uh, from, uh, or dust in particular from statically charged surfaces. So, in conclusion, in choosing the optimum solution for your application, do consider the materials of construction, including items such as shims, which are used to uh, hold open the gaps in any particular uh, compressed or uh, engineered nozzle or application device. Are the shims plastic? Are they actually metal? Because plastic wears out a lot quicker. Uh, is the product anodized or powder coated or protected in some way if it's an aluminum part? Or, or some material that could be affected by your factory environment. Efficiency is important. What's, what people often look at is they say, oh, this is using so much CFM. Well, you wanna know how much air you're using at your particular pressure for all the conditions that you presumably evaluated. What is important to really accurately determine your overall energy consumption and your operating costs in many ways is the maintenance but also for the energy consumption is the force per cfm or velocity per cfm but normally you can measure the force and you can measure the flow you want the highest force per cfm to determine efficiency because different manufacturers have different designs for example in our particular air knife uh, we had someone compare our air knife to theirs at one point and said, well, ours use 30% more air. Well, no, it doesn't. Ours use the same amount of air at 60 PSI compared to the air they consumed at 80 PSI. So in actual fact, we were more efficient because you can operate at a lower pressure. And for those of you in the compressor industry, know that it's less energy to produce 60 pounds pressure than it is to produce 80 pounds pressure. So don't just look at the CFM. Look at the ratio, force per CFM. It's like with the air amplification ratio on your amplifiers. Consider everything. Don't just take a figure. What's the reference point? This is why force per CFM gives you a proper reference point. It's not just one thing. In conclusion, if you have an application for cooling, for blowing, for drying, for cleaning, in fact, for conveying, uh, as we have other technologies, please do contact NextFlow Air Products. Uh, we and all of our global associates around the world can assist you. Please visit our website at nextflow.com.